Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. In this session, we welcome Professor Matthias Mambilia Polan for a presentation and discussion about clarifying the concept of social capital through its three perspectives, the individualistic, the humanitarian and the macro social perspective. Matthias has a PhD in applied economics from the University of La Coruna in Spain, and he's a specialist in international marketing uh, from the Polytechnic University of Madrid. He's also a professor in business in the business department at the University of La Coruna. He's a member of the Society of Advancement of Socioeconomics and of, and of Social Organizations, Institutions and Markets and Applied Market Research Group. His research interests are linked to socioeconomics and marketing, having published articles in various international journals and books on, on different roles as, as an author, as a co-author, coordinator, and an editor. Uh, he's published a few books as well, such as Social Capital, it's a, a glossary, uh, and The Economic Value of Social Dimensions, and The Theory of Social Capital. He's also a director of the website on, on social capital, which is www.capitalsocial.org. And as you can understand from this introduction, he's, he's a, really a specialist and an expert on social capital and has published quite extensively in this area. So welcome, Matthias, and, and over to you. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. I am really delighted to be able to speak here in this platform of social capital research. Um, I think that um, we must give uh, Tristan and Mario and company a thanks to have this uh, tool because it's really important in the world of socioeconomics, in the world of social capital. It's really important, uh, social capital today, sometimes we speak, as we will see in this presentation, we hear about uh, human capital, about uh, financial capital, physical capital, but social capital nowadays is a really important matter. I started uh, studying social capital uh, years ago when I carried out my PhD in applied economics. Um, later, I entered in the area of micro research in the Faculty of Economics and Business in the University of La Coruña. But I, I continued uh, working on social capital and also uh, in, a transver in a transversal way with marketing uh, researches. So um, I continue with social capital be because it's really a passion, it's really a beautiful um, uh, matter. So it's uh, really, I really like to work in, in it. So in the sense, I have published uh, two books, one called La Teoría del Capital Social, The Theory of Social Capital. Another is a glossary of terms of social capital. And I also had the opportunity with some colleagues to publish other articles. One of those has the same title as the webinar uh, we are going to present today. So if you agree, I can start with it. So as I said, uh, and Tristan, uh, express it in the sense, this presentation, this webinar is entitled Clarifying the Concept of Social Capital through its three perspectives, individualistic, communitarian, and macrosocial. This comes from an article I wrote some years ago with my colleagues, Jose Atilano Pena Lopez from the Faculty of Economics and Business of the University of La Coruña. So let's start with the presentation. Okay, we are going to speak about uh, social capital. And as we know, social capital has received increasing attention in the last 25, 30 years, not only in the academic field, but also in the public sphere. Here in this figure uh, that I obtained from a Scopus database, we can observe the growing in the number of publications of uh, social capital. But what happens with social capital? One important aspect uh, is the, uh, related to the concept. The concept is uh, multidimensional and is uh, complex. So in some way, it has led to some confusion and ambiguity uh, about the theory and to critics uh, from many authors. In this sense, uh, we would like to present a synthesis of social capital in three perspectives. The first one, call it individualistic or microsocial. 
The second one, uh, communitarian or mesosocial. And the third one, macrosocial or is macro institutional. Our intention is uh, to potentially clarify or un understand in a better way what is social capital and also what its functionalities are. So for what serves social capital? As an introduction, I would like to uh, comment the concept of capital. According to Austrian economist von Baberg, capital is the set of undirected and intermediate goods that have the virtue of making activities more productive. As I said before, uh, traditionally, we hear when we speak, when we uh, listen some uh, aspects about economics, we hear about physical capital, natural capital, financial capital, and human capital. But what happens with the social dimension? The social dimension really matters. It's also important because it brings individual and collective goods. In its sense, it can be categorized also as a form of capital. And this social dimension is concretized through the concept variable social capital. Okay, if uh, one person, if an individual asks us about what is social capital, and he or her uh, does, does not have idea, any idea about social capital, the best way is to give a consensus definition, because we are saying that this a complex concept is a multidimensional concept, so we cannot elude any of the uh, dimensions of social capital. In this sense, uh, we propose uh, this definition of social capital, a consensus definition. Social capital is the set of attributes of the social dimension, norms and values, trust, networks of interpersonal relationships, etc., that favor the functioning of the economy, the society, and the institutions. We can understand this definition easily, but we know that it encompasses many things. We have here cognitive attributes like norms and values, relational attributes like trust, and um, structural aspects like networks of interpersonal relationships. So social capital is multidimensional, but why? Because the social element is multidimensional itself. From this fact comes the main critique to social capital. So the main reproach falls on social capital about the ambiguity of, uh, of this variable. In this sense, it is called an umbrella concept because, as we are saying, it brings together many different things, many different aspects of the social dimension. We have other critics in the literature. We have speak before about the concept of capital. Some critics come because it's cataloging as a form of capital. Recently, in a webinar of a social capital research in a social capital research platform, uh, uh, he uh, spoke the uh, professor Weinstein speaking about this cataloging as a, as a form of capital. And there are other critics like the circularity or, or, or ontological definitions. But here is from our, for our interest to focus in the umbrella concept. They say that it's an umbrella concept and this is justified. And we can find this in the literature. For example, Das Gupta, a uh, well-known researcher on social capital, say that social capital is a constant difficult to outline. Only Rancon, a wonderfully elastic term. Tascupta and Sarah Holding, a notion that means many things to many people. Roche and Gannon and Roberts, a vague, vague and imposed concept. And fine and ambiguous, if not incoherent concept, and valid for everything. Okay, we have these critics, and we are saying that the term of umbrella concept is justified due to its multidimensional nature. But as Castiglioni points out, criticism is part of the takeoff of all theory and paradigm, and more when we move uh, in concepts like social capital that is uh, partially new and also abstract. So, peculiarity of social capital does not negate the relevance it has, because it's really important in the social fact, in the economic fact, and also in the institutional performance. And as we will see later, it has other types of returns. 
It's important to point out that not or no other variable is capable of solving the problem of the embeddedness between the social and the economic. Anyway, this theory should go deeper in clarifying the concept and also the link between the cultural aspects and the structural aspects, because we are speaking about norms, values, attitudes, beliefs. We are speaking also about uh, social networks. We are speaking about trust. So which is the link between these three dimensions? And which is also the link between the micro social capital and the macro social capital, because this is really a, a gap in the literature of social capital. So uh, the theory of social capital, it must also clarify the validity of the indicators used for its empirical measuring, even though it is difficult to have a single quantification system, simply because social capital as we are going to be is situated in three levels, the micro, the macro, and the measure. We have to say that there are some composite index that try to calculate a social capital in a, in a, a, as a single way. For example, the civil society index. Okay, we are going to present the three perspectives of social capital. But first of all, we make a review in the literature. Uh, what happens in the, in the literature about the classifications of the definitions, for example, and measurements of social capital. Herreros distinguish between the network approach and the culturalist approach, being the first one more focused in the social network as it is obvious, and the second one in social, uh, in features of the social organization, like for example, social norms or social trust. Robinson et al. indicate that some authors focus on what social capital is, others on the source of social capital and others on its effects or consequences. In this sense, it comes another critique that we said before, the circularity or, or, or tautological definitions. Gulko Kandaraya and Praritz point out the communitarian view, the network view, the institutional view and the synergy view of social capital. Castiglioni differentiates the thick conceptions from the thin conceptions of social capital being the thin conceptions, uh, aspects like, for example, values, norms, more cultural aspects, and thin conceptions, uh, tr social trust. Paldan talks about three families of concepts within the theory of social capital. The one who says his trust, that he considers the most important, the one who, that equates social capital with easier cooperation, and the less one, the social network. This at all differentiate between the sociologist definitions and the political scientist definitions. And these classifications is close to, the, to that of errors. Science sociologist definitions study more the social structure and political scientist definitions uh, focus more in the futures of the social organization in a global or a generalist way. Finally, Millán and Gordon link the different streams of social capital with the thought of the following authors. James Coleman, Robert Puna, and Nan Ling. We have them in these photos. As you know, Nan Ling in the top left. Then we have James Coleman. And on the bottom, we have the professor of uh, Harvard University, uh, Robert Puna. We consider, because uh, maybe it's the closest um, uh, classification uh, to our, uh, we consider this these authors, we are going to consider them the three streams of, uh, or the three perspectives, main perspectives or social capital. Okay, we search an optimal classification of social capital perspectives. So it must be clear. Also the objective is to know clearly what social capital is and what it does or is capable of doing. This is the returns of global social capital. It's a problem must have the possibility of empirical measurement. And the definitions of social capital must be able to fit into one of these perspectives. In this sense, uh, we can say that with a high probability, if we look to the literature of social capital uh, and, and we find many definitions of social capital, they are going to fit with high probability in one of the three perspectives that we are going to present now. These are these three perspectives, and we are going to analyze them and also 
to uh, present the empirical methodology that accompanies them. These three perspectives will repeat are individualistic or microsocial, communitarian or mesosocial, and macrosocial and macroinstitutional perspective. It is important to um, highlight that this division corresponds to the triple cataloging of social capital as an individual good, as a collective good, and also as a public good that does good to carry out. In this sense, social capital, as we know, generates returns for the individual, for the group, and for the whole of society. We start now with the individualistic or microsocial perspective of social capital. And in this sense, uh, we um, can say that he, uh, he considers social capital as an individual good. This perspective is widespread in the literature. And here, as a classic authors, we have Pierre Bourdieu or Nan Lin. This is what is called the network approach. So social capital here is an individual resource that consists in the networks of relations of the individual that bring him a set of instrumental and expressive resources. For example, instrumental, information opportunities, support, income and status, expert advice, and expressive resources, for example, well-being, health, recognition, mutual life, sense of belonging. But it is it's important to point out that these resources are going to depend on the type of ties of our social network. In the sense, we know that uh, we have strong ties and weak ties. What is called bonding social capital, the strong ties, are, and bridging social capital, the weak ties. So they provide different type of resources. I would like to present this figure that is from a recent research we are developing. And here we found two dimensions applying principal component analysis, two dimensions of social capital that we relate to bonding social capital and bridging social capital. And we, we can appreciate that the resources embedded in this type of ties are different. It is in Spanish as I translate. For example, if we want fiscal advice, legal advice, financial advice, labor or medical advice, it is more probably to uh, find the resources in our weak ties, sometimes in our strong ties, in our bonding social capital. But, but there are more expertise, there are more instrumental resources. If we need help in case of illness, in case of uh, economic problems, in case of children care, in case of elderly care, uh, in case of doing um, uh, moving to another house or need a, a house to live, it is probably that we are going to ask our strong ties or what is called bonding social capital. In this sense, it is really important the individualistic perspective because it, it speaks about the resources available for the individual from its social network. Which definitions can we find in the literature that fit into this perspective? For example, as we said before, if we analyze the definition of peer Bourdieu, social capital is the aggregate of real or potential resources that are linked to the position of a lasting network of, of, of more or less institutionalized relationship of mutual knowledge or recognition. Or the one of Nan Ling, the resources embedded in an individual social networks accessible and mobilizable through existing ties in those networks. Or for example, Boxman, the graph and flap, the number of people you can expect to support you and the resources those people have at their disposal. I would like to point out briefly that we can find a difference in these definitions because for, for some authors, social capital is the social network that provides some resources to the individual. But for others, is the resources embedded in those social networks. In this sense, uh, in my opinion, the best way is to catalog as social capital the social network, because it's the social element itself. Which is the measurement in the individualistic perspective? Here uh, is, as we said before, a micro and structural approach, and we analyze the extension of the individual network and the resources that it implies. And to do this, we carry out a survey 
and uh, that is uh, we use it to provide information about the access to nodes and the effective capacity to mobilize them when some resources is needed are needed. Here we can differentiate three popular methods, the name generator, the position generator, and the resource generator. All of these have some advantages and disadvantages. In the name generator, a list of contacts proposed by individual is created for each of the proposed resources. The main disadvantage of the name generator is that, uh, as we may, you may know, uh, it is a bit biased to a strong ties. And also, it is not very representative. In the position generator, a respondent is presented with a list of socially useful positions for the purposes of the focal subject and is then asked about the first individual who could give him access to the resource, considering in addition the level of relationship between them. The main advantage is that it gives us the main advantage of position generator is that gives as a bigger mapping of the social network of the individual. And the resource generator, uh, in the resource generator, according to Van der Gag and his leaders, specific resources are presented to the individual and they are asked if they know someone capable of supplying them. This is according to these authors, more representative, more direct, and also uh, has the good thing that you, we can analyze in an effective way, the capacity of mobilization of the resources. We move now to the communitarian or mesosocial perspective. And we are going to see that it is different to the first one, to the individualistic one. Why? Because here we consider social capital as a collective good, not only as an individual good. In this sense, social capital is a community resource, a set of attributes and properties present in the social structure that facilitate the cooperation and collective action. Classic authors that moves in this approach of social capital are, for example, Coleman, Upov, or Bowles and Finnish. Which are these attributes and properties? For example, uh, norms and values that are shared among the members. Also, trust and trustworthiness, beliefs, procedures, precedents, roles, rules. But also, as Coleman points out in, the, in his seminar article, Social Capital in the Creation of Human Capital, they, are, they, they matter also a, a set of entities that he calls channels of information, obligations and expectations, penalty systems, the closure, the appropriability, and the authority relationships. So all these properties, all these entities, and all these attributes conform, in this case, the social capital that is a community resource that serves for the whole group in this perspective. So its axis of study is the social dimension or social infrastructure, according to Norman Kupov, which contains a set of resources that, in addition to serving the individual, favors cooperation and good functioning. We can apply this perspective to any kind of group community, association, neighborhood, education community, business organization, etc. etc. Okay, which definitions can we find in the literature that fit in the communitarian or mesosocial perspective or of social capital? The first one we want to highlight Coleman once. Social capital is defined by its function. It is not a single entity but a variety of different entities having two characteristics in common. They all consist of some aspect of the social structure and they facilitate the routine actions of individuals who are within the structure. We have also the Fukuyama one. Social capital can be defined as the existence of a certain set of values and informal norms shared among the members of a group that allow cooperation between them. Or for example, Bowles and Hindis. Social capital generally refers to trust, control for relationships, willingness to live by community norms, and to penalize those who do not. Okay, which is the measurement in the communitarian perspective? In this approach, if we analyze the literature, uh, the authors try to focus in the cognitive attributes or aspects of social capital, in the structural ones, and also in the relational ones. 
So they focus in the norms and values in the social network and also in the particular trust within the group. Because they increase, the, if they are well implemented, they increase the probability of cooperative behavior within the group. For example, Coleman links the school drop out with the strength and frequency of interaction with parents and community, the family structure, parents' expectations of their children, residential mobility, the presence of parents in the home, their relationship with their children, and the type of school the student attends. Really important for Coleman because it um, changes sometimes, sometimes the type of community around the um, around the children and also around the parents of the students. Sayan Gosal and Sarvaya Santamayo analyzed the business environment and observed it. So we are here in, in, on, in, in other area. We are here in the, in the business companies and observed that social interaction, trust and trustworthiness within the organizational structure and certain vision, favorite productivity, exchange of resources and promoted innovation. So we are, seeing in the Coleman and Sayin Gosal researches that they focus on structural, cognitive, and relational uh, actives of social capital. Finally, Upov, in an important research, studied how the Galoya irrigation system in Sri Lanka doubled its efficiency by modifying cognitive and structural aspects of social capital, introducing what he calls the social infrastructure. Okay, we move now to the third perspective of social capital. And this is more generalist, more global, both in what is social capital and also in the returns of social capital. In, in some way, this uh, perspective is a bit more ethereal. We will see it in the definitions, more specific, but really important too. Social capital is a macro social, and macro-institutional resource that encompasses aspects such as civic mindedness and social trust that favor the functioning of the economy and society in general. So here we consider social capital, as we are saying, a public good more than an individual and collective good. Classic authors that move in this approach of social capital are Robert Putnam, Nakan Kiefer, and Inglehart. So this approach is more culturally oriented. And as we are saying, it conceives social capital as a resource that benefits the broad socioeconomic, the, the, the benefits the socioeconomic aggregate in general. And in this sense, social capital, it is said that to be important for the functioning of the democracy, for the institutional performance, for market articulation and economic development, for global well-being, or for example, social cohesion and the progressive. The, the progress of civil society. Which definitions can we find in the literature that fit in this approach, in this macro-social and macro-institutional approach? For example, Putnam one. Features of social organizations such as trust, norms, and networks that can improve the efficiency of society by facilitating coordinated actions, or Sarah Heldings, the glue that holds societies together, or Inglehart, when he says that social capital is a culture of trust and tolerance in which extensive networks of voluntary association emerge. Which is the measurement in the macro-social and macro-institutional perspective? Here we're, we are going to present two main approach, approaches. The first one comes from the Putnam uh, thesis. We remember his books, uh, Making Democracy Worse, and it expresses that associative activity and civic engagement favor the institutional performance and also the economic development by promoting the civic attitudes, attitudes and social trust. The second one also equates social capital with civic mindedness and social trust, but it radiates the necessary correlation with the degree of social capital, of social trust and civic mindedness with the associative activity. And in this sense, we find authors like Nakam Kiefer, Uslander, Gisotol, and Durante. We have to say that there are some critics to put an thesis, although it has some reasons to um, carry out this thesis that we find in the literature 
many critics, for example, the one of Paxton, the one of Stola Lewis, they speak about the degree of kindness of the association. They speak about the frequency of interaction inside the association. Also, if they are open or, or closed association, bread seekers association. So we have a lot to debate, to discuss um, in this approach of Robert Putnam. That is an important one. So how do we measure social capital in the perspective? So if we have these two approaches in the first perspective, in the first approach, Putnam employs the density of voluntary organizations as a tool by measuring civic commitment to the per capita number of groups and associations. For example, church groups, labor unions, sport groups, academic or professional societies, political and fraternal organizations, which the residents of each region or state belong to. In the second approach, they measure directly the social trust and the, and the civic mindedness. For example, we know uh, the typical question of the world value survives. Generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted or that you can be too careful in dealing with people? We have also other indicators. For example, the Wallace test used as an experiment by Nack and Kiefer. Some wallets are abandoned in a city and the number of returned wallets is according to these authors, an indicator of social trust. Or for example, we find surveys with questions about norms and civic attitudes used by these authors and also uh, from others with uh, like Giso, Sapienza Fingales and many others. Because some of the researchers consider or equate social capital with civic capital. Okay, I would like to finish with this uh, slide and also to highlight the uh, statement of Martin Palian when he says that the potential of social capital has not yet been fully covered. When we presented the perspective of social capital, we spoke about some of the returns, but here uh, we take them together to see clearly the importance of social capital in the micro, in the meso, and in the macro level. I am, going, I am going only to read these returns of social capital, but if you want, we can discuss later uh, any of them. They are all supported in the literature by many authors and researchers. So for example, in the individual or micro social capital, the returns are material support, physical support, emotional support, all really important for the individual, demography, demography, transmission of relational links, physical and mental health, socialization and education, information, opportunities, and influence. We can think, for example, when we look for a job, sometimes there is a flow of information and we get some opportunities. Dissemination of knowledge, happiness and well-being, the returns in the communitarian or mesosocial, Cooperation, collective action, really important, highlighted by, actor, by authors like Anne Ostrom, for example, or Tilly. Association, community development, education and social control, like Coleman points out. Solidarity and support, we can see it now in the Ukraine war. Collective well-being. And in the macro-social and macro-institutional social capital, we have as our returns, social and economic interaction, economic development, reduction of transactions cost, all are really uh, linked to social trust and social cohesion as a consequence. Institutional performance and good governance, as Putnam points out, or social well-being. So we can see that this is really important, social capital is really important because it is linked with the concept of civil society, and in this sense is uh, it matters not only for the individual, for, but for the group and for the whole society, for the whole economics and for the whole per institutional performance. As a conclusion, we said at the beginning that in recent years, social capital has gained an increasing attention in the academic and in the public sphere. We expressed that, uh, also that it is called an umbrella concept and uh, it is due to the fact that it's a multidimensional concept. And in some way, it has caused 
uh, some problems because it is more difficult to recognize its utility. So in this presentation, we tried to uh, present the three perspectives of social capital in order to try to clarify a bit this concept and also to present the empirical uh, methodologies that accompanies these three approaches. We only remember now in the individualistic or micro-social perspective, social capital consists of the set of social networks that provides the individual with instrumental and expressive resources. Social capital also lies in the attributes and properties of the social structure that facilitate its cooperation and collective action. This according to communitarian or social perspective. According to the macro-social and macro-institutional perspective, Social capital resides in general cultural aspects, such as civic attitudes and social trust that favor the global functioning of the economy and society. Social capital is therefore a multidimensional concept, but as we see in the slants of the global returns of social capital, it has a great potential in its application. For this purpose, it is really necessary to clarify what social capital is and what it is for and also to solve some gaps, some lacks in the literature, like, like the one we commented before, for example, the link, the mess between the micro and the macro dimensions of social capital. Here are the references, most of them are in this article. So thank you everybody. I am now uh, available for any questions or comments you want to do. Thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation, Matthias. It was really interesting, and I think it really helps people to, to understand the very different perspectives that exist in the social capital literature and, and maybe avoid some of the confusion that it can really easily happen when you're trying to read literature that is from different perspectives and it almost seems to, to contradict itself. You know, some literature says social capital is, is X, and then you read something else and it says social capital is Y, and that can be very, very confusing for people, I think. So so it's really helpful, I think, your presentation to, to understand these different perspectives and the way that social capital is treated differently from their different, these different perspectives. So we'll, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. And we have a few questions that have already been submitted in advance. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat uh, or you can raise your hand within Zoom and we'll, we'll get to your question as well. I wanted to ask you a question first. I know you've published a bit about the relationship between social capital and economic theory, you know, neoclassical economic theory. And certainly quite a few of the, the previous scholars who have published on social capital have talked about how social capital is corrective to the, the narrow um, narrowness of economic theorizing. Um, uh, James Coleman specifically talked about that in some of his early work. I know Lyndon Robison um, also talked about how uh, by bringing in the idea or the concept of sympathy into understanding market functions, we could perhaps correct for some of the, the narrowness of, of neoclassical economic theorizing. So I was wondering if, if you could share your thoughts about how, how social capital perhaps relates to economic theorizing and how perhaps it's, it's contributing to the changes within economic theory. Okay. Uh, as we know, um, the mainstream of economic theory nowadays is the neoclassical paradigm. We all know the figure of homo economics, that is, utilitarian uh, is rationalist. Um, he is neutral in terms of values. In some way, he is a social. So we consider that um, it is not real, as many other people and many, many other heterodox um, schools of, of economics. Uh, it is not real because we must consider the social dimension. As we uh, say at the beginning, social dimension is an input for the economics. So we cannot um, forget this social dimension. And um, the social dimension acts. Um, if, if we analyze the definition of uh, Leonard Robbins in the 30s, we can see it clearly because the social dimension, both in the uh, aspects of social, ne uh, social networks, 
both in the aspects of uh, norms and values and ethics, always is present. In the use of the means we have in our goals and also in the social organization that is um, an important part uh, that is going to be a resource also for economics. I would like to say that um, as Ethioni point out, also uh, and other authors, we have three pillars in the economy. There is the civil society, Ethioni calls community, others call like Spin Anderson, the family because is maybe the more important one inside civil society. But we have civil society, we have the state, and we have the market. According to these authors, if one pillar of those um, has problems, the other two has to intervene, has to make the work it is not lasting. Uh, so in the sense, if we have a stronger uh, civil society, it has implications because, for example, the state it, uh, has, uh, doesn't have to intervene so, so as much as it is doing, for example, nowadays. Fukuyama uh, speaks about this point also. So in this sense, I, I think that it's really important to consider the social dimension. The neoclassical paradigm, uh, paradigm uh, doesn't do it in an effective way. And the socioeconomics and the social capital uh, theory uh, brings us some benefits in, in this sense, I think. Yeah, I think so. So let's move to other questions. Um, Marion, you've got a, a question in the chat. Did you want to pose yours first? Oh, thank you, Tristan. Um, yeah, so many questions. Um, you talk about the one that's fascinating here is Durant, uh, Durant uh, in 2021. Uh, talks about the rejection of associative behaviour, um, the uh, the discussions that he's, he's actually got there in terms of the cognitive level of social capital. Um, when we're looking at habitus, a lot of us are sort of looking around the concept of habitus. Um, could you, uh, is this an important, this is a very important point, if you could just elaborate on that for us? Possibly. I I am sorry, but I I couldn't understand pro properly. Could you repeat me or clarify? The, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, could you just explain to us how Durant uh, rejects associative behaviour? Um, that was a, an interesting uh, point that you actually made. Um, article in 2021. It, it rejects the associative behaviour. Um, the, the sociologist behaviour. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sociologist behavior. I, I, I say that I read it sociologist behavior. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so we'll, we'll have a look at Durant as an important source for discussion of like the associated behaviour, which is around the area of capital, uh, habitus that we're actually uh, interested in as well. Sorry, I, yeah. I, really, I don't understand because I am Spanish, I am a bit far, and maybe because we have very different accent. I am really uh, sorry, but I can't understand in a proper way the, the, this question. I, I'm sorry so much, but... No, that's uh, fine. So, Marin, you asked uh, another I, question. I don't understand maybe the words. I am sorry so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I did ask another question about, about Machiavelli um, and the link that he has with social capital. Um, any answers to that? Any hints as to how I can actually... Um... Okay. Um, we know that, uh, for example, I teach marketing and sometimes um, we, we, marketing is nothing new. Uh, some, some, uh, the new is the um, specification as a theory because in the 18th uh, century, some strategies of marketing was applied for the same in social capital. Social capital, the main point is that we um, focus all the aspects in a theory and we enrich the theory, but social capital was there because we are speaking about social networks, about values, about norms, 
about civic virtues. And civic virtues is what Machiavello, Machiavello uh, points out in, in his uh, writings, in his books. He speaks about, for example, civic spirit and civic virtues. In the sense, uh, and also it happens with Aristoteles, Tony, uh, Adam Smith, and others, we can appreciate some aspects of social capital theory that um, has, um, uh, we can find in the, this type of, of, of authors. This is because this is why I quoted Machiavello and the other authors in the evolution of the history of social capital. And certainly in some of Matthias's uh, books and articles, um, you've talked about how social capital isn't a new idea and that mm. these ideas from Machiavelli, uh, Smith, uh, Durkheim, Hume, like all of these other uh, scholars in the past and philosophers have talked about these same sorts of ideas that now we talk about in social capital. And so social capital is not new. Um, it is really just a different way of framing and talking about these same concerns and considerations that have existed in uh, the political economy and in sociology all the way back to Adam Smith um, and the Enlightenment. And I think that it, it's useful to think about it in that way because some people hear the term social capital and they think that it's new, um, but it isn't really new. The ideas aren't new. Um, like you've talked about in your book. It, it's not new, it's really just a, a different way of framing or, or using language to communicate those, those same ideas. Yeah. Uh, so in the chat, uh, Foucault, uh, Foucault asked about measuring social capital, but of course you, you talked about that a little in your presentation. And I think it's a very big topic, so I don't think we wanna go into any more detail about that. Uh, so for card, there's, there's lots of um, details on websites and in journal articles about measurement, um, but it, it's too big a topic for us to explore in, in any detail right now. Uh, so if we move on to, to some other questions, uh, Sabita, you have a question. If you would like to unmute yourself, you'd be welcome to ask it. Sabita, would you want to ask your question? Um, yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, what's on our, our mind with the war in Ukraine and thinking about how they've responded as a country and society, as well as how the leader has, is operating within that society. And wondering if this is a, if this is a concept we could apply in the different layers of social capital to study war and, and how wars happen and how they roll out in, in uh, different instances. And as we see this war happening, um, if that concept of social capital can be applied to what's happening there. Sorry, to what, to what is happening in? The war in Ukraine. So, for uh, instance, right. the way this, the, the communities and the okay. society has reacted, yeah. if that concept is useful in analysis yeah. of political yeah. warfare. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the other day I, I was watching television and I saw a man that they, are, uh, they were interviewing uh, him and he was in a, sleeping in a church and, and he said that uh, he didn't know anybody, but they, they were helping him. So uh, it came to my mind the idea of Nan Ling when he speaks about belonging social capital, the sense of belonging. And in this sense, I think that in Ukraine, in moments of fear, in moments of uh, problems, and due to the identity of people and um, these things, it increased the sense of belonging and increased the belonging social capital. And in this case, it increased something like the community or communitarian social capital that is important for, for give support uh, to ones to each other. So in the sense, um, also uh, the other day I, I, I was thinking in other aspect of social capital, that is what is uh, known as linking social capital. 
we usually uh, hear about bridging and bonding social capital, but linking social capital, as we know, is um, the vertical association between people, uh, um, for example, the authorities, or for example, the institution in position of power. So it is really important uh, nowadays in, in the Ukrainian war in order, for example, to bring help uh, to, to the population of Ukraine. But it is uh, two, only two elements. It is sure that you uh, have thought in others that I thought uh, when I saw the Ukrainian war and in relation with social capital. And it's an area of research, I think, that is has a lot of potential. Uh, there's yeah. some research around disasters and the way in which social capital can change quite quickly in response to very specific types of circumstances that might occur, such as natural disasters like earthquakes, but perhaps also in relation to conflicts that, that start very quickly and the ways in which social capital may change in response to uh, those events because clearly there is uh, some of the underlying social capital that existed before the conflict started, um, clearly has an influence and a role to play in the social capital that exists now within the Ukraine. But also the, the social capital is changing, no doubt, very dynamically and, and quickly as a result of the, the actions of individuals within the, the Ukraine, um, say the, the, the actions of, of President Zelensky, for example, no doubt has a lot of influence on the way in which Ukrainians feel about things like solidarity and belonging to, to the Ukraine. So some of the uh, recent research that's been done, particularly out of uh, social psychology, for example, that looks at the way in which perhaps emergent communities may form and, and identity and belonging and solidarity might change quite quickly in response to certain events or circumstances. So I think this is a, an emerging area of research uh, on social capital that I think has a lot of promise. Uh, to, to help us to understand the ways in which social capital can be dynamic and can change quite rapidly. Uh, shall okay. we move on to the, to the next question? We have a question from George. Uh, if you would like to unmute yourself, you'd be welcome to ask your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my question is simply uh, it's about the perspectives. That's the perspective from which you try to explain this. Um, does it equate to the dimensions of social capital? And if so, how do they um, um, operate? Um, um, that question at which might seem um, bundled together with the other one is what would you say is the relationship between uh, cognitive structure and relational social capital? Um, what are they? Because sometimes you find some elements of some elements of structural social capital in cognitive social capital and relational social capital. The differences are not very clearly stated in the literature. So, what would you say? Are they strictly um, different um, ways of uh, um, measuring social capital. So I just want you to situate this between the perspectives from which you try to explain this and how they are measured. So George, is is the first part of your question, um, what perspective do those dimensions of, of structural, relational and cognitive, you know, what perspective do those fit within? Like, is it the micro perspective or is it the, the meso or is it the macro or is it all three? Is that the first part of your question? All three from the angle um, which he started, the individualistic, communitarian and the mesosocial. Are they related to the dimensions of social capital? Yes. Um, this is uh, uh, the other way I, I saw an article that used uh, structural equations in order to analyze the relations between the three dimensions of uh, social capital. These three dimensions we 
presented cognitive, structural, and relational. So it is a really important question because, for example, the shared norms and values create certainty, and, and, and in the sense, it, it can create a trust and trustworthiness. Also, trustworthiness can strengthen the social network. So there are many relations. Uh, we focus when we speak about these dimensions in the uh, in the group, in the group, in the functioning of the group, and in the sense we uh, presented it in the communitarian social cap, uh, social capital. But it is also present in the society, in the macro perspective, because the society has networks, has own law, on, uh, also uh, social norms, has values. The society has social trust, and it is true that it influences also the resources that the individual obtain, because the micro level and the meso level are related. If the community, if the group uh, functions better in its communitarian way, in its cooperative way, the final resource available for the individual are going to be uh, higher, bigger. So in the sense, they are related, the dimensions, and also they are related to the perspectives. And we say that in, in, in our view, is one of the, a bit lack or gap of the literature to try to find the, the relations between these dimensions, this perspective, more or less, I think that uh, uh, more or less what, what you are saying, what you are asking is an important point. So I've got a last question, if you permit me. Yes, go ahead, George. Okay. So um, when you are um, carrying out the measurement of social capital say in a survey, you do not ask people directly what social capital is. So how come are you able to say that the responses that you obtain amount to social capital? Well, uh, if you define, if we define what is social capital uh, and social capital, we are defining it in the micro as social network that provides us with resources. We are going to, uh, to carry out service asking about if they know people that can bring them their resources, if they can mobilize their resources, because they are defin def uh, def uh, de defining in a previous uh, states what is social capital and also in the micro and in the macro we define and then we ask people if they trust in other people because we consider that social capital according to the previous literature is also social trust and civic mindedness according to Putnam according to many uh, well-known authors there are also other empirical measurements we spoke the one of Nakan Kiefer that is more an experiment, but uh, surveys and questionnaires are, are really common. So, George, uh, are you suggesting that if we if we told the participants what social capital is, we could then yeah. ask them specifically how much they yeah. had, for example, of this social yeah. capital? This, yes, yeah. and and they may have a different uh, 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 view of that, but because we are only asking them aspects of social capital and then we aggregate them as social capital in our um, analysis so as far as the participants are concerned what you are measuring are concepts not social capital but we put them together as social capital so um does that really measure what the people truthfully believe is social capital to them well, I think I think that perhaps there are two two issues here. One is, should we be aggregating these things together? You know, should we be adding basically trust and norms and sense of belonging and solidarity and treating them as all together being the same? Yeah. Um, and if maybe that's okay to do, or maybe maybe it's not because it loses the the understanding or the complexity of the social environment. But I think your question then is, can we ask participants to do that themselves? You know, can they aggregate all of these things and give simply one score for everything that we mean as social capital? It's an interesting question. Perhaps not one that any of us have answers to. 
perhaps uh, there are uh, benefits and disadvantages to, to that kind of approach. And it's certainly something that I've thought about before as well. Uh, for me, I think that the, the issue of aggregation means that what aspect, you know, if we're saying to people that social capital is all of these things, it's about connectedness, but it's also about norms and trust, uh, you know, social trust and these things. When they're answering about social capital, what are they thinking about when they answer? You know, are they thinking, oh, I'm very, very connected, but I don't have very much social trust. So how do they evaluate the complexity to give just one answer? It would seem that we would be losing our detail. We would not be um, collecting as much information that's rich and helps us to understand a social context if we were to do that. Um, that's, that's my perspective, but there's perhaps others as well. We have to say also that in the, in the empirical measurement, there are composite index of social capital. I, I commented one before. We have, for example, uh, we have the, well, I, I quoted the civil society index, but there are many more. Uh, I don't have them. Uh, the civic index of civil society and indicators of healthy civil society and global civil society index of an year. So this index try to measure different dimensions of social capital in different levels. So in the sense, we, as, we presented at first a consensus definition of social capital. And in the sense, um, this type of index are composite ones and it can be interesting also. Yeah, absolutely. I agree, I agree with that. So anybody else have any comments about the, the way in which we might measure or we might aggregate different, um, different components of social capital into a measure? Uh, Kai, Kiyomi has a question. Yeah, Kiyomi, should we move on to your question? Feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I, have the I have a question about the difference between individual and community perspectives. Um, because the community, uh, no, the important um, parts or important part of, of community is individuals. A community is a uh, um, accumulation of individuals. So, and I have interest interest in about uh, community um, social capital. So, if we measure personal trust network and norms, does it mean which we measure the um, social capital of community, or still it, is is it um in individual social capital? Thank you. Well, it sounds like a question about aggregation as well. Can we measure personal trust amongst a large number of individuals with a community to give us an indication of the community level? Like, it, I guess the question really is, is personal trust um, the same as, or can it be aggregated to tell us about social trust? Um, okay, in the, what, what is known as individual social capital, it, what we present, as the micro perspective of social capital. This is the set of networks and the associated resources, instrumental and express. In the communitarian perspective or meso perspective, and according to Coleman, Kupo, and other authors, and Fukuyama, for example, we point out the solid norms and values, the trust and trustworthiness, and other properties, entities an aspect of the social structure. Why? Because if they are well implemented, if they are um, a common reference in people that conforms the community, there is going to be a, a better cooperation in order to achieve uh, common goals for the organization, for the business organization, for the school, for the uh, association, for any kind of group. Uh, regarding the aggregation of the particular trust and social trust, we know that not always happens this because there are uh, sometimes particular trust in, in our organizations. Uh, we are in or in our family, but we don't trust in people in general. And as we know, and we spoke about the critics to the, the the, the, the Putnam thesis, 
there are associations, for example, that are rent seekers, or also that maybe generate some uh, uh, negative externalities. In the sense, people in those associations can have particular trust, but no social trust, and they don't generate with the other people uh, social trust. So the aggregation, I think that not always happens. I don't know if more or less I, I answer it, but. Thank you very much. I understood um, individual social capital is a part of community um, social capital. Thank you. It is certainly part of, but we need to be careful about how we apply uh, things like trust that are understood at an individual level and whether or not those same concepts can be generalized to a societal level. I think that's the, that's the most important point that I took from what Matthias had to say about that question. So should we, should we move on? There's, there's a question that was submitted in advance. Uh, it was actually submitted in Spanish, so I'll, I'll read the, the translated version. This was from Rafaela who asked about, uh, who said that their doctoral thesis on the role of social capital in citrus marketing and the working on the creation of social capital through small businesses. And so the, I'm not exactly sure what the question was, Matthias, but I think, I think you have a, a response to that question from Rafaela. Yeah. Um, okay, in, in the commerce in general, in regarding social capital, well, um, here, well, regarding social capital and marketing, we are uh, combining two areas of knowledge. So what happens with the small commerce nowadays? I understand that Rafaela refers to the physical commerce. So the physical commerce nowadays and some specific types of commerce uh, are having problems due to the, to the fact that uh, of the increasing of internet. And sometimes if they are not uh, big companies, they cannot compete also in the online market. So in general terms, um, they must try to adapt also to the online, uh, carry out um, a multi-channel, alumni channel um, strategies, also using experiences, sensations, and emotions, also um, having a good shortage and also um, searching for a good price in order to compete in the market. But regarding what happens with social capital in the small commerce, in the commerce to compete in the market, it's important to differentiate, as we may know, the um, intra-social capital of the organization. And also it is really important, the relational capital, the external uh, cap uh, social capital or relational capital with the intermediaries with our uh, customers. For example, it is very well known uh, nowadays uh, the, the relational marketing. It uh, highlights the importance of the relations with customers and intermediaries in order to look for the benefit in the middle and long place, and not only for the benefit in the short place. We have to create re uh, relations and we have to have, we must have a uh, social and human capital inside the commerce. Why? Because we are speaking that social capital are ethics, norms and values, and a good atmosphere also. It creates what is called by Bruni, Oslaner, Zamanje, uh, and others, what is called the relational goods. And relational goods is the communicative and affective dimension of the social relations. In the commerce, they can compete in the human side. This is, um, uh, to make more attractive the, co the, the commerce to people. And also it can be relevant to try to be, to, to, um, to strengthen the belonging social capital. This is to uh, get more involved in the community in which the commerce is. Well, th these are topics to think and, uh, and maybe to, to write, but a bit extensive, so uh, maybe to, to ask or to answer in one minute, I don't know. Absolutely, and, I, and it sounds like social capital has a lot of promise for the area of commerce and marketing uh, to, to further our, un, our understanding and there's some, perhaps some rich opportunities for research in that area as well. Should we move on? There's another question that was submitted in advance by Jose Lopez. 
Um, they say that they have coined the term societal linking social capital in his thesis. Some people have called it an awkward term. By it, I mean overarching linkage among state institutions and civil society institutions with externalities for the wider society. Is that term comparable to macro social capital? Okay. Um... We express it that macro social and macro institutional social capital is conformed by social trust, civic mindedness, and global features of the social organization. This is the perspective of authors like, as we pointed out, Ingle Harnack and Kiefer or Kundan. The linking social capital, as we know, is the vertical association between two agents in different positions of power. For example, individuals and authorities business organizations and authorities, association and authorities, something like this, more, more vertical than other types of associations. In this sense, this seems a new term, societal linking capital. And he want to refer to the, the, the link between the civic society and also the state. Uh, I think that the civil society, the most important thing is that it does not depend on the state. And if we start depending on the state, if we are a civil society, according to Fukuyama and others, uh, we can lose uh, some abilities to, um, com to, to, to function as civil society. So regarding this link, I am not sure that is appropriate, but maybe in some ways that I am not thinking now, uh, at last is an original term and maybe a term to, to think with, with more detail. And as you said, I think the, the most relevant scholar in this area is Francis Fukuyama, who has written about civil society and also about uh, social capital. So anyone who's interested in that area, I guess uh, Francis Fukuyama would be a good, a good author to, to read further about. Uh, there's another question that was submitted in advance by John Keeley, who asks, what are the importance of this social capital to society? What economic benefit comes from social capital? It's a big question, of course, so perhaps just a short answer. Yeah, it's a big question. We presented in the slides the returns, the global returns on social capital. We saw that social capital is important in the micro for the support of the individual. It's important for the well-being and for the happiness. It's important in the communitarian for the collective um, uh, pro uh, purpose of the organizations. It's important in general for the economic development, institutional performance. It's important for things like health, for things like education. So we are speaking that social capital is very transversal and it has uh, many uh, utilities and it generates resources for individuals, for communities, for groups, and also for the whole society. If it is well implemented, because it's really important for the social capital to be well implemented. In the sense, I would like to highlight one word. This is the word prosociality. Prosociality is very important because if one allies According to Fenema and Tilly, the, the concept of content of social capital. This is the moral or the thick aspect of social capital. It's very important because the norms and values must be pro-social in order to have good consequences of social capital. Absolutely. And I think also Joseph Lewandowski has written about capitalizing sociability and has talked also about the importance of, of pro-sociality, of being pro-social and how that, that idea really underpins what social capital is all about. So we have one more question uh, that was submitted in advance. So if anybody else who's here in the audience now has any further questions, then um, post them in the chat or, or raise your hand and we'll get to them next. So this question was submitted by Parwan Ahmed who asks, what is the role of educational institutions and schools in the formation of social capital? Or on the contrary, the role of social capital on educational institutions, especially in schools? Okay, it is also a very, maybe extensive question to, but I, I will be uh, briefly. Um, Education is one of the most important topics that is inside the social capital theory. 
and we pointed out the, the study of uh, uh, the research of Goldman. We can uh, think in social capital created by educational institutions, by schools, and we can think also in social capital uh, as an input for the, uh, um, for the educational achievement. So, for example, Coleman studied this, this last point. But we can think, for example, in the community around the school that it can be promoted, it can be fostered by the school, the community between parents, between parents and teachers, between teachers, between the school and other entities and other centers and other schools that can be, um, that can enrich in general the result of the school, the innovation and many things like this. In general terms, the social capital is really important as Coleman pointed out and other previous authors like Hanusik, for example, for the um, uh, academic result because the student has a family background and has a pair group and to study the social group of the individual, it is really important uh, to analyze the academic results. So we can say that is an uh, important determinant, the one of social capital. Absolutely. And in the chat, uh, Sabita Ramlal talked about, um, mentioned that she's going to be presenting next week in, a, in the same session, uh, a webinar talking about the role of social capital in higher education access. Uh, so anyone who's interested in this topic perhaps can come along to the webinar next week. And I'm aware that there's quite a number of people who are in our group who are very interested in education and the role of social capital. And perhaps it's an area where people can collaborate uh, and work together in this area. And certainly a very important one. So there's one more question has been posted in the chat by, uh, by Fuad. Um, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, he asks, what is the role of socialization in the formation of social capital? Um, it is really important, uh, the socialization, because, um, well, in, in Spain, so, so, socializar has two meanings, two, two meanings. The first one is to interact, and the second one is like educate, to educate, educating values. I don't know uh, what he's referring to to interact or more to educate? I think socialization to me, that, that would mean that to, to come to understand the, the social context, the, the social rules, you know, the way in which children and, and young people yeah. are socialized into society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's important social capital because if the individual, like for example, uh, modern societies, uh, there is a problem, the problem of Many people is alone, the problem of the uh, excess of individualism. So if the individual has not people around him, uh, some kind of family or friends or community, it is very, um, it is a bad thing for the well-being and for happiness. It's, it is very studied, for example, uh, uh, from Blanche Flower, Oswald, and many other researchers. But it is also important for, as we are saying, for socialization, because the individual uh, must interiorize a social comprehension, a psychological comprehension. He, has, he, he must um, uh, deal with other people in order to know what is wrong or what is correct and to interiorize good norms and values because he will uh, um, has to behave in society. So if the, individu if the individual has a higher education, a higher socialization in norms and values, then uh, its behavior in society with probability will be a bit better. Absolutely. And I'm trying to think of some scholars who have written about this in the literature, and I can't think of any names off the top of my head. But I have written an article about the, the sources of social capital, and I did, um, in that, I was able to find some literature that talks about particularly the role of family and uh, the schooling process, the educational process, and how that contributes very strongly to the socialization of individuals that then helps them to, to be connected and to learn social skills and to, to basically learn how to trust and communicate and, and those kinds of things. So the, 
there, there certainly is some literature that relates to social capital on this issue um, that you, you may be able to find. And I think it's a, also a, a rich and interesting area of research as well, where we may be able to apply some of the, the communication theories, the ways in which people engage in communicative action um, with other people to form the kinds of shared understandings that we talk about when we're talking about norms and, and uh, trust and, and belonging and these kinds of things. Of course, all of these things are formed through communicative processes with other individuals. So I think that's a very er interesting area of research that perhaps could be explored um, by, within social capital. So we seem to have got to the end of end of the questions. If anybody has any final questions, now is your opportunity to either post them in the chat or to, to raise your hand. Just give you a moment if you do think of any, any final questions or thoughts you would like to share. Sorry, will you be sharing the slides? Uh, Matthias, are you willing to share your PowerPoint slides? My slides, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Matthias, if you, if you email them to me, then I can send out the link to everybody who's registered. Ah, to email, okay, 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 yeah. That's the yeah, easiest, that's way, okay. easiest way to send them out. Okay, thanks, George. Any final questions? Final question um, from me and George. Um, so in, you identify social, Computer as an umbrella concept. So, in um, investigating or undertaking social capital uh, um, research, are you able to choose one of the perspectives and ignore the other aspects, or you need to bring in all the three aspects, as you mentioned? Great question. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't, I am not sure if I understand in a properly way, but if we find the, if we find the, the researches, if we look for different researches in social capital, uh, they don't identify the perspective exactly. So uh, we, with this clear, more or less, in my opinion, uh, maybe a bit contribution to clarify the perspectives we can situate and we can obtain the returns we want for our research. But I, am not, I don't know exactly if, 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 if this is what you are asking. I think, I think George is partly asking, you know, do we need to incorporate the individual perspective and the meso perspective and the macro perspective? You know, do, as a researcher, do we need to, to look at bonding and bridging and linking social capital as well as looking at, you know, structural, relational and cognitive dimensions? And I think the tendency perhaps for some people is to try to do too much. To, to adopt too many different approaches and understandings. And, and I think that's what you're saying, that, that often creates a lot of confusion because they don't always uh, work well together. Sometimes they actually conflict or contradict each other. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, in, in the slides I presented, I, I look to the definitions in order to classificate because it is true that some authors adopt one perspective in one time, but other, uh, other times other. For example, Robert Putnam uh, is, uh, also uh, research and, and speaks about social network a lot. But the main point of, of Robert Putnam when we speak about uh, Robert Putnam is the thesis of his book, Making Democracy Work of uh, 1993. So in this sense, I got this, um, definition of social capital, but sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, absolutely true that some authors are a bit transversal, not for example, Nanlin. Nanlin focus always in the micro perspective in the network approach, but others are more transversal. And I think the choice of a theoretical perspective or conceptual perspective should be guided by the research question. And if we're interested in a particular context or a particular research topic, then we may choose um, one particular perspective over another perspective because it fits and it, it works to address or to answer our particular research question. 
And the same researcher may at a different time address a different research question and may adopt a different conceptual approach that is most suited or best suited to that particular question. So, uh, you know, I really would encourage people to to think carefully about their research context and to think about what conceptual approach, what measurement methodology, uh, you know, all of these things that are best suited for your particular, uh, you know, research context. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, some people have a tendency perhaps to criticize one approach uh, or a different approach, uh, but I think every, every approach can have some value when it's applied to the sorts of research questions that it suits. Uh, you know, the, the network approach suits very well some types of research questions, but it doesn't suit other types of research questions very well. And I think that's up to individual researchers to, to think about that and to be critical for themselves. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, uh, briefly, I, I would like to say that it, uh, it is important to try to analyze this gap between the micro and the macro, because if the network uh, goes uh, fine if it is functions properly. Maybe it has positive externality, externalities to the macro level of social capital. In this sense, it's very interesting to analyze this link, and there is uh, a bit of gap in the literature. Yeah. And I would add to that as well that um, you might be very focused on the, the micro level. And so the question of, well, does the meso or the macro level, is it relevant to your research question? And that's something that you need to determine for yourself within the scope of your theoretical perspective and, and your question. And sometimes it will be, you know, because of course the meso and the macro level does influence the nature of our, our, our values and our beliefs. But in some research contexts, that's very important. And in other research contexts or questions, it may not be as important. And that's something that each individual researcher needs to, to think about and define for themselves, I think. Yeah. All right, I think we've, we've come to the end of our time. So uh, Matthias, we, we thank you very much on behalf of everybody and the whole group. We thank you very much for your time and effort. We know, we know how much it takes to prepare a presentation and to come, especially on a, on a Friday evening in Spain um, to, to present. So we really appreciate it. And we thank you for your, for your time and effort. No, I, as I said before, I am delighted to be in this extraordinary platform of social capital. I would like to thank you very much, uh, Tristan, and to whole people, Marion, and other people that uh, were here in this uh, webinar. I, I, I really appreciated it, and it's for me um, amazing. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. I'll stop the live stream now. Okay.